By late 1986, Glenn Doran's excavation team had endured almost three years of painstaking exploration of southern Florida's Windover marshland. Mentally exhausted and physically drained, little did they know they were about to uncover their most significant find, a mysterious substance covering some of the bones. It was neither human flesh nor animal hide. Professor Doran thought he could detect tiny fibers and you could see it. It was a piece of seven plus thousand year old twine. It was, in a sense, as good as the day it was manufactured. You could see the twist and it was obvious. This was hand woven fabric. If Doran's hunch was right and these mystery fibers were the remains of a textile, then this would send shock waves through the scientific community. These threads would be the oldest fabric of any importance in America and the only surviving proof that such ancient people could weave. We were also pretty quick to realize that none of us on this team had had any experience in analyzing fabric materials. Doran contacted America's foremost expert on ancient textiles, Dr. James Adavazio. I and my late wife, Rhonda, went down and walked on the site on one of those days when it was 95 degrees, the humidity was 90 percent. The sweat was dripping all over the place. They physically uncovered the suspect area in one of the burials, and the light was just perfect to indicate that that's exactly what it was, where textile remains. They would look at one, and then they would move a few feet, and look at the second one, and then stand up and move to the third one. And after about an hour and a half of this, I asked Jim, I said, was it worth the plane ticket to Florida? And he stood up and he says, you better believe it. This is like nothing we've ever seen. And so we, in fact, told them, well, these are twine textiles. And after the requisite leaping up and down and screaming and yelling, we decided to then figure out where to go next with all this. Once again, the discoveries at Windover were forcing scientists to junk the idea that ancient Americans were primitive people. By 1986, over 10,000 bones and hundreds of artifacts had been painstakingly excavated from the Windover bog. But as soon as the fabrics were removed from the protective peat, they began to decompose almost immediately. The race was on to save these precious ancient garments from certain destruction. When we started to identify the fabric materials, there were sort of two things that went through our mind instantly. One was, did we have the preservation techniques in place to deal with this? And the answer was pretty easily no. Glenn Doran needed to try the latest techniques, the very best science could offer. So he turned to Bruce Humphrey, the man who'd saved relics from the Titanic. Humphrey's innovative secret process involved coating the objects in a microscopic layer of the chemical perylene. The place where perylene really shines in the preservation world is with the most fragile, the most degraded uh, materials that uh, would otherwise perhaps be lost. There is no known way of preserving them by normal conservative techniques. And with perylene, we can deal with these kind of objects and save these materials that are simply in danger of being lost altogether. Paraline acts as molecular glue, a barely traceable layer of preservative that penetrates the object. In this case, paper burnt to ash, invisibly strengthening it and preventing decay. The coating cycle is now complete and the chamber has been returned to atmosphere. We're going to lift the lid. Inside is our cell with the ash paper. And in a little over an hour's time, We've transformed this fragile, friable material to a completely handleable substrate. If we compare it with its other cousin over here that wasn't treated, you can see the extreme difference in handleability. This is a, a film of perylene. As you can see, it's not unlike saran wrap. So invisible is it that we can do amazing things. I'll give you an example, this material is from RMS Titanic. This is a magazine that we theorize belonged to a first-class passenger. It was rolled up and casually put in a suitcase and spent 85 years on the bottom of the ocean at 12,600 feet and recovered during one of the expeditions to the site. In April 1989, a desperate James Adavazio agreed to let Bruce Humphrey test his state-of-the-art paralene process on a rapidly decaying fabric sample. 
even Humphrey was overwhelmed by the result. It was an amazing sight to see these materials uh, come through this entire process of desalinating, freeze drying, and then have them come out of the chamber with this amazing definition to the fabric. I mean, some of the fragments that we've done so far, you can see minute detail, and you can even examine these fabrics under a microscope, and the paralene does not interfere with studying the microstructure of the weave or anything like that, so it's an amazing result. James Adebayo couldn't believe his eyes. This revolutionary process saved his rare and delicate samples. This piece that I'm orienting, I haven't touched with my own hands for more than 10 years. To see it like this, remarkably similar to when I first saw it come out of the ground, to be able to pick it up, to be able to show it to you, is impossible to put into words compared to the fragility of the specimen when we first encountered it. For the first time, fragile fabrics like Windover's could be preserved and studied at leisure. Dr. Joe Lorenz of the Coriel Institute in Camden, New Jersey, is performing brand new analysis of the brain DNA using techniques no one had access to back in the 1980s. Lorenz is re-examining sections of DNA called haplogroups in the brains of five Windover people. He's looking for haplogroups found only in native North Americans because finding them would corroborate all previous work. When I sequenced larger fragments and I was looking for the sites that I know are characteristic of Native American haplogroups, um, I was surprised because I did not find them. In contrast to all previous findings, Lorenz couldn't confirm the Windover people were Americans. Further investigation revealed something even more remarkable. I went back to the screen and I looked at the sequences again. The first person's DNA it looked European. When I looked at the second one, it looked European. When I looked at the third, fourth, and fifth, they were slightly different from the first two, but they looked European. Lorenz had found DNA unlike any other from Native Americans. Most scientists believe that some 15,000 years ago, people walked from Asia across the landmass now covered by the Bering Straits into North America. Lorenz's results could be consistent with a new and controversial theory that proposes some of the earliest people migrated to America from Europe, perhaps by crossing an Atlantic Ocean significantly narrower than it is today. If our genetic analysis shows that these individuals really do belong to a new and previously unidentified lineage, founding lineage in the New World, it would be very big news. So the race is on to find the final proof. But for the moment, Lorenz's work has added to the mounting evidence of an early European migration and stirred the controversy over the most extraordinary journey in human history.